it's very easy to see where the propaganda machine is directing itself. And um, yeah, there's a war on your your natural gas stove in the home, and um, and it's coming near you. Look, at we said in this piece, like if you own a furnace, you um, drive a vehicle, and you occasionally barbecue in your backyard, they're coming after you for your emissions. And so um, we suspect that the overlap in the Venn diagram of those three attributes and your listeners is pretty high. So people ought to be paying attention to this because they they will you know, they will make it happen. In it. Um, to In It to Win It, this is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. Today's guest has a knack for early pattern recognition. He and his team spoke early about the supply chain, energy, food, water, and fertilizer crises. They're also very good at exposing the insanity around our current energy policies. Is the energy situation going to improve or get worse? How will this play out in the markets? How can we invest and what bets should we place to make money from it? The spokesman for Doomberg is here to shed some light on the subject of energy going into the future. Doomberg, thank you for coming on the show. Steve, it's great to be here. Looking forward to a great discussion. I know, I know you got a big pile of really hard questions for me there and looking forward to tackling them all. Good. Yes, we've got uh, some questions from the Hive. Um, let's start out. Can you just take two minutes and give us... Um, your background and how that led to the green chicken little and starting the doom bird sub stack. You bet. Yeah. I'm a scientist by training a couple of decades in corporate America. Our team, all our former uh, executives from the corporate sector um, built a consulting firm several years ago, lost most of it to COVID as, as happened to many small businesses had to reinvent ourselves, um, reinvented ourselves around helping content creators run their businesses better which um, was actually quite fun. And, and we discovered that we enjoyed the process of content creating ourselves and uh, started Doomberg two and a half years ago. We write six to eight times a month about finance, you know, energy finance and the economy at large, mix in a little crypto just because we're so curious um, uh, of the whole sector there. And then, um, you know, I've had great success. We went paid last year and this is what we do now for a living. We um, kept only our favorite clients on the consulting side and we basically do Doomberg almost full time. Uh, it is the work of my life. And the big advantage I think that Doomberg has over other similar commentators in the space, whose work obviously we consume and respect, is that we come at it from the industrial side. Most people with decades of industrial experience don't participate in the public discourse because they have public affairs professionals and stock options to worry about. And, you know, they'd rather stay uh, in their part of the universe, in their corporate cultures. And so when we bring the sort of practical corporate side to some of the insane policies that we see rolling down, uh, rolling out of Washington, D.C. And, uh, and other capitals of the world. And that gives us, I think, a pretty unique look at the world. And it, it's, um, you know, it's it's taken off and, and we've just got to ride this out as long as we can. You know, I got to say that uh, the uh, chicken avatar from a business and marketing standpoint is absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, when we started Doomberg, we had zero social media footprint to work from and we had a choice to make. You know, do we go face the market as a person, i.e. like me, for example, I'm the, the forward facing part of the team. Um, that's not very memorable. I don't have a very memorable face, to be honest. And, um, you know, um, people that look like me are a dime a dozen on Fintwit. And so one of the things we sort of hypothesized was that if you, if you can't be, if you, if you don't stand out, you can't be remembered. You know, you can't be remembered if you don't stand out. And when the green chicken scrolls by your phone and the, the, those um, sort of uh, unique eyeballs, you know, it's just clip art that we colorized. It's no big secret, but it works, you know, it's funny. It induces laughter. It, it, um, it just sticks out. So if you're scrolling YouTube and you see the green chicken on a podcast, you know, you might, if you start, you might want to listen to that as opposed to if we were just another person, another face, uh, that looks like they spent 20 years in industry probably wouldn't have caught on. I, I do think it is, is a real fun part of it. You know, we try to be funny without being silly. And I think the logo sort of captures that perfectly. Well, the politicians give you plenty of material. So. <laughs> you know, it's funny you should say that. When we started Doomberg, one of my concerns, yeah, we had no idea it would blow up. It was more like, hey, let's just write 20 pieces and see where it goes. And um, I thought we'd run out of stuff to write about. And uh, I mean, the news fairy just keeps dropping magic pixie dust my way every day. I've got four or five great ideas right now. It's edit day today. You caught me at a good time. Today is um, I've handed the piece over to our editor in chief, who basically takes a whole day to turn these decent pieces into great pieces. And um, that gives me time to reflect on what we're going to write about next. And um, I've got like four or five crazy ideas in the hopper and it's just, it, it never ends. You know, the news cycle uh, just keeps delivering. Yep. 
They do. They never disappoint. It's great. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start off your macro big picture view of the global energy situation. Um, the global energy crisis is over um, for now. The uh, whims of Gaia smiled upon Western Europe in general and Germany in particular, and even here in North America. And the price elasticity of demand for commodities, especially difficult to transport commodities like natural gas, is such that it doesn't take much of an oversupply situation to have prices fall through the floor, and it doesn't take much of an undersupply situation for prices to skyrocket through the ceiling, which is why it, within the same sort of 365-day period, we've seen the price of natural gas in Europe range from $100 per million BTU down to $8 per million BTU that it is today. Um, the molecule hasn't changed. The difficulty of handling that molecule hasn't changed. Um, what changed is the weather. And um, Europe, thankfully, by the way, uh, made it through 22, 23, um, relatively unblemished from the worst case scenario possibilities. But of course, there was a significant price to pay for all the preparation and storage that went into making that possible. Uh, and now we're heading up for another winter and we'll see. And maybe they'll get lucky. It'll be warm again. But right now, um, I would say that um, across all commodities, the world looks relatively well supplied. Um, and uh, that's why you're seeing coal six. 50, 60% off its highs, oil, 50% off its highs, natural gas, 90% off its highs. I mean, it's undeniable. We're looking at the charts that um, that the crisis of uh, 21, 22 um, abated with the, with the, with Gaia smiling upon uh, Europe. Um, the big question in our mind is, um, are our political leaders complacent about the subject now? And if they are, what are we looking for in the market to indicate perhaps early signs of uh, a, an emerging crisis for 23 and 24. Um, and so that's the big thing we're grappling with. You know, in our macro view, you always start with, is the world amply supplied with energy or is energy in shortage? And then all of your other analysis has to flow from that. And right now we would be the first to say that um, looking at prices across the board, you know, commodities are priced uh, in, relative to their historical values and, um, and, you know, natural gas in particular is, is in the tank and we'll see, um, but much depends on the weather. And, um, and so, you know, that's not anything that uh, we can model. That's for sure. You know, going, going to the uh, uh, German uh, crisis that happened last year, they spent something like 500 billion trying to uh, make sure that they had enough energy for the winter. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, they did a bunch of stuff, right? So they went around the world and, um, sc scoured the world for every BTU of energy they could get their hands on, regardless of cost, as you just alluded to, but also carbon footprint and impact on the emerging economies. Um, estimates vary depending on how you calculate it, but it, it's on the order of several hundred billion dollars for sure. Um, and of course, they have um, um, retreated to the coal mines and um, they brought back on copious amounts of coal-fired power. They were amongst the dirtiest grids uh, in the past winter. You know, when the wind doesn't blow in Germany, which it doesn't during the winter for periods of time, the doldrums are a well-known phenomenon and the sun doesn't shine either. Um, the, the grid must go on. And, and so all these renewables that have been forced onto the grid in Germany, all they have done is secured the long-term place for coal um, and natural gas. And um, because you really need essentially a backup grid, um, you know, ironically, um, during the coldest parts of the winters, when you have the highest drawdowns on on fundamental energy commodities like natural gas for home heating and so on, and um, we'll see how they do. You know, they foolishly shut down their nuclear power plants in April, and it's it's well known story. And so, you know, they they have um, they have decided that their good fortune was in fact an endorsement of a sound strategy. And uh, we had been warning that this was um, the worst possible interpretation of events, you know, we kind of, we find ourselves in a bit of a dilemma, of course, you know, um, we, we're not sitting here cheering for a bad outcome to be proven right. We're deeply empathetic people. We have thousands of subscribers in Europe, uh, lots of friends in Germany. I've visited Germany countless times, love the country. Don't, we take no pleasure in Germany impaling itself on the altar of uh, climate change and making catastrophically foolish blunders at the national level for its energy policy. Um, and we we are in this weird situation where we hope to be proven wrong. And when the weather cooperates, um, suddenly every troll on Twitter is calling us alarmists. And we would say the best outcome last year when we were raising the alarm on this was to be called an alarmist this year. And so we'll take it. And, and then I would 
conclude by saying we first started writing about this crisis long before the war in Ukraine and long before natural gas prices exploded. And so when you warn about something and then it manifests and then eventually you have a blow off top and it you know, regresses back to the mean, um, I don't know, how wrong were you? It's, it is what it is. So um, our policy position is simple. We would like every human on earth to have access to abundant life nourishing energy. We would like that energy to be cheap. Cheap natural gas, cheap coal and cheap oil uh, are things we are uh, celebrating. We, we don't invest uh, in the commodity sector. Um, we invest privately, I suppose. But um, by and large, um, when the world is amply supplied of energy, the world is a better place. There's less war, there's less famine, um, and that's good. And even though our name is Doomberg, that's kind of, you know, a cheeky sort of, uh, you know, just sort of a brand thing. We're, we're ultimately, we're not sitting here cheering for doom just because it drives eyeballs and clicks to our, to our sub stack. Yeah, I was talking with Justin Hewn about this, and we, we joke that Germany finally got off a of baseload energy. You know? And yeah. uh, he said, <laughs> you kick is... that nasty habit of cheap, reliable baseload energy that underpins their entire society. It's about time they stopped uh, trying to be civilized. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And he was saying this is a great list, litmus test for the rest of the world to see what happens when they do it, you know. Yeah, we'll wow. see. I mean, California and New England are doing their best um, Germany impersonations. And um, really, it's amazing. We put this piece out earlier, I think, in the week, and um, we had this pipeline map. I'm not sure if you saw it, but, um, you know, we, we call it, I think I found your problem. So you just look at the U.S. pipeline map and then draw a box around California and draw a box around New England. And that but basically are none. And then in the sort of the, the trifurcation of the U.S., the sort of the great, mostly sane flyover country has these abundance of pipelines that um, you know, the, let's just say I'm glad I don't live in New England or California because ultimately, you know, the coastal elites are, you know, condemning their serfs to a life of energy poverty. It's just a matter of when, not if, these foolhardy policies will come home to roost. Yeah, true that, true that. Uh, okay, uh, the unhedged capitalist. I, I thought this was a joke. I had to look it up. Uh, but he's talking about the New York State gas stove ban. And apparently... They're trying to ban gas stoves in residential units. I think it's supposed to take effect in like the beginning of 2026 or something. He says, is that legal? Is it going to hold? Well, I mean, it's the law is whatever your legislators say it is. And so, yeah, sure, they could ban the, uh, the, the installation of new stoves. We wrote about this early in the year, predicting that this would be um, one of the big trends, that the piece is called Home Cooking, and we published it on uh, on January 18th. Yeah, sure. And we we basically took apart the scientific nonsense that was the sort of the basis of this wave of propaganda in the news cycle. You know, we because I come from a science background in particular, I know just how much garbage is flowing flowing out there. Like peer reviewed um is is next to meaningless these days given the proliferation of of journals that nobody reads. And um and so yeah, of course, uh, in fact in Germany, uh one of the things they're doing is there's a big boom right now in the installation of furnaces in Germany, for example, because um, after this year, it's going to be next to impossible to get anything that combusts fossil fuels installed in your home or your commercial property. So gas stoves, uh, which aren't you know very prevalent in Germany, but furnaces in particular for heating in the winter, they're trying to force everybody onto heat pumps, which we've written about. That was actually the first piece we wrote this year. 2023 would be the year of the heat pump. Um, and if that turned out to be true, it's very easy to see where the propaganda machine is directing itself. And um, yeah, there's a war on your your natural gas stove in the home and um, and it's coming near you. Look, at we said in this piece, like if you own a furnace, you um, drive a vehicle and you occasionally barbecue in your backyard, they're coming after you for your emissions. And so um, we suspect that the overlap in the Venn diagram of those three attributes and your listeners is pretty high. So people ought to be paying attention to this because they they will... You know, they will make it happen. In in a related piece, we talked about this this heat pump stuff that I mentioned, and um, we we had some fun predicting. Um, you know, you may as well go with it because it's coming. And, and uh, the, that piece was called "A Home Near You," and uh, we said if if you have a child pondering whether to get a liberal arts degree, you should direct them into the HVAC industry because there's going to be a huge shortage of qualified technicians to come and completely rewire the way people heat and cool their homes. And uh, and we're seeing that play out as well. So yeah, the, this move in New York and California banning gas power generators, you know, as their grid becomes less and less reliable, this is all, you know, it, I, the biggest mistake I ever made as a child was reading 1984 because it's all just coming to pass. You know, it's just crazy. He was right. <laughs> he was right. Oh my God. I mean, I can't, the, the only book that was more accurate than that was Atlas Shrugged. I mean, it, it just... Um, 
yeah, it is what it is. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay. What is your opinion on CBDCs, central bank digital currencies? I think that central bank digital currencies are a enormous threat to privacy and individual freedom, and they should be opposed uh, vigorously um, now, long before they have gone too far down the implementation pathway. Um, money, in fact, is not a private good. Um, uh, it's not a public good, it's a private good. And, and there is a fundamental right to privacy in the way you transact and the way you care about your personal business. Um, that is not to say that um, secrecy, you know, secrecy is different than privacy. Like you have a right to privacy. Secrecy is a different thing. And um, to, um, to proclaim that right should not draw suspicion. Like the Fourth Amendment exists for a reason. And a set, in, in a world where we have central bank digital currencies, the length of the putt to go from there to controlling how you spend your money is an incredibly short one. And if anything, our leaders have shown that when given an inch, they will take a foot when it comes to power. And you can very much imagine a world where um, our, our learned overlords come down and say, Steve, you know, you, you bought a case of beer five days ago. Do you really think you need another one? Or, hey, Doomberg, you know, you took a, a plane flight last week. Um, we'll just give you five gallons of gas now. That's, that's your allocation. Like once government has line of sight into everything that you do and they have control over whether or not your transactions are approved, um, this is a real giant. This is why, by the way, even though we're crypto skeptics, we've written quite quite critically about some of the tactics being used to crack down on that industry because those can very easily be applied to any other industry. Um, and, and you know, due process is important, um, and, and the government and too, too all, far too often ignores it. Um, it is a fundamental aspect of American democracy to be deeply skeptical of your government, and in a world where the government controls um, how you spend your money what you're allowed to buy and what you're not allowed to buy. Um, that is a true dystopian nightmare. And whatever the attributes of CBDCs that the, the proponents are proclaiming as benefits will be far outweighed uh, by the complete loss of privacy uh, and the complete loss of freedom on the part of, uh, of individuals. And, and, it, and it's, I, I unabashedly am pro-freedom, uh, pro-individual liberty, uh, pro-self-determination, pro-freedom of speech, and um, none of those things um, are things to be embarrassed about. They're things to be proud of. Yeah, it uh, kind of piggybacking off of what you're talking about cryptos. Uh, we got a, a, a crypto question from Mike. Uh, he says, give us a prediction on the death date of both Coinbase and Binance. I have mine. Do you have yours? Yeah, I would separate the two of them. So they are both running afoul of and with the, our next piece on this, which we're publishing on Friday, is uh, tentatively titled the My Solana, um, uh, Solana. And um, both of them are, stand accused by the SEC as of today of trafficking in unregistered securities. And that is a very, very deep, deep offense in the eyes of the SEC, the brightest of their red lines. Binance is different than Coinbase in that it also stands accused of outright fraud bordering on criminal fraud. Um, and um, some of the things in the filing document against Binance, if proven true in a court of law, given the benefit of the doubt and all of the, the, the freedoms um, that we still enjoy in this country, look pretty damning. And I would say also that Coinbase's CEO was not personally charged in the way that CZ was with Binance. You know, there's some differences, but at its core, the SEC has thrown the gauntlet down and has said that all basically all crypto tokens, except for... Bitcoin, which uh, is not really a crypto, well, I mean, it, it, let's not get down into the definition weeds, but Bitcoin is has been adjudicated as an asset, and Ethereum is somewhere in between. Everything else in the eyes of the SEC is an unregistered security. Um, they are securities, and they need to be registered before you can sell them to unaccredited investors, which is the key point that we're making in our piece. The venture capital community saw a cheat code in circumventing the initial public offering disclosure process to bring a private entity to the public markets and cash out on their illiquid investments. And when you really do a deep dive and look at the how we test and look at the evidence the SEC has in those complaints, it's just undeniable the vast majority of these crypto tokens are in fact securities. So to the question, I think Binance dies much quicker. Coinbase is a in a, in you know a much cleaner, dirty shirt, um, and they have a little more runway and a little more political protection in the U.S. Um, 
they have time to fight things out in court. I think uh, the distinction between FTX and Binance is is one without much of a difference if you read that filing. And if that, if the, that filing turns out to be anywhere close to accurate, um, Binance is going to be uh, not long for the planet. Um, and I think Coinbase um, probably has a much longer expiration date. Okay. Okay. And macro view, long term, um, do you see governments banning crypto? I see governments banning unregistered crypto. Okay. And I see the dominant use case for crypto, and again, differentiating from Bitcoin, um, to be money laundering. And so if the dominant use case is outlawed in the US dollar system, I think volume collapses and, and the whole edifice comes crashing down. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, there's just no doubt that um, finance could not withstand a full know your customer AML uh, you know um, management setup uh, and in fact any exchange that tries to do that sees a fraction of sees their volume fall by you know uh, the vast majority of it just goes to the other exchanges that are more you know um, KYC AML compliant and in fact the size of Binance compared to the size of Coinbase you know even correcting for wash trading it dwarfs Coinbase um, and Coinbase only exists because it, it's as a relatively, you know, clean operation, trying to be mostly right by the law, they they um, they can charge enormous fees because it's one of the only sort of ways that legitimate investors can you know open an account and express their views on various crypto coins um, as a U.S. based investor. Uh, the overseas, you know, giant casino that is crypto, um, everything goes no KYC AML. The big challenge with all these these like Binance, if they they just stayed out of the U.S., they'd be fine. Right, like they, they, but they, they had this Binance US, and they try to pretend like the the two were separate, and they commingled customer funds again. All allegations, and I should say, like Binance has its time in court, and CZ has his time in court, but um, you know, stacked up against each other, the accusations of Binance, uh, accusations against Binance are far more serious than Coinbase, but the accusations against Coinbase are existential. Like the SEC basically came out and said the vast majority of Coinbase's business is illegal. And it shocks me that the market hasn't responded more than it has. It's really made them the most amazing quote on my screen right now is Coinbase bonds. I understand why stocks don't respond and meme stocks and Reddit and all of that stuff. Why the bonds are not reacting more strongly to the fact that the SEC came out and all but called Coinbase's business model illegal is amazing. It's stunning. It just shows you the complete dis uh, dissipation of fear in the market's uh, for the SEC, I, when I was in industry, man, you got a note from the SEC. You, your your hair on the back of your neck stood up. You sat up straight. You you called your attorneys and you said, "Please help!" Like this is a big deal now. Yeah, the Grim I mean, Reaper just walked oh right in front of you. God, you know, like the fear of death. The last thing you ever wanted to be was called on the carpet by the SEC. They could ruin your lives. They have ruined countless lives. I have friends whose lives the SEC has ruined. For no fault of their own, they bad, you know, wrong place, wrong time, wrong company, whatever. Um, inappropriate email, inside joke, looks bad on the, the black and white of a of a transcript, you know. Um, but here we have the SEC charging Coinbase. Um, by the way, like for all the discussion of whether crypto or securities, the, the SEC is also charging them with the fact that they are operating simultaneously as an exchange, a custodian, and a clearinghouse, and you, you can't do that. That's a big no-no. Now, all of this sort of predicates on at least one of those things being a security. But as we're we're talking about in this piece that the publishes on Friday, like when you go through the Howey test and you apply to crypto tokens like Solana, like it, they're so plainly securities. It's just undeniable. Either Congress passes a law that redefines what a security is, or these people have been breaking the law for a very long time. And I, it is a really an amazing time where the SEC can drop that lawsuit, the stock barely sells off and the bonds do nothing. I, I'm really baffling to me. Eventually there'll be an accounting, I think. I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, from Uzair Hashmi. Hi, Doomberg. I'm in the early stages of learning. Can you recommend a couple books which would give me a better understanding on how crude oil and commodities work? I'm constantly confused on what to look for and what to ignore. Thanks. I love your content. Yeah, appreciate the question. And um and uh, I would say any book written by Daniel Jurgen or Yaklov Smeal. 
Uh, Daniel Jurgen. I haven't heard of the second guy, Yakmash. Uh, uh, Yakmash Smil, S-M-I-L. He's written some really fantastic books. The one I would recommend is called Energy and Civilization. Just taking this from the top of my head. Um, really, really fantastic. He has a new book out right now whose name escapes me. Um, but if you just go by Energy and Civilization, you will be um, light years ahead of the rest of uh, society. But Daniel Jurgen's written some really great book. Uh, the Quest, I believe, is is a book that recasts history through the pursuit of energy and, and you know, uh, uh, analyzing World War II through the lens of oil is really fascinating. And, um, you know, uh, energy is life, as we like to say, and these two authors do a particularly fantastic job of explaining um, this in really visceral terms. Okay. Uh, from KI2500, getting into oil here, how, how will oil do in the coming recession? If the world is undersupplied, will the price of oil stay up despite the recession? How high can oil go in a five-year time frame? And does today look like the 1970s or worse? I would say the oil market is uh, really fascinating to analyze right now, and here's why. So um, everybody involved kind of needs prices to be around $80 a barrel. Um, the shale patch needs that. Saudi Arabia needs that. And... Um, the political pressure from the Biden camp is they would like much lower prices, of course, because the price of gasoline at the pump in Biden's eyes is a key indicator to his political uh, uh, prospects uh, in, in the next election. And so what we're seeing right now is uh, sort of a, the, the paper battle for the price of oil and then the physical markets. And um, something's got to give like the Saudis. So he, as you read the news through this lens, right, so we see. The OPEC meeting, the Saudis basically um, do a voluntary one million barrel a day cut. Okay, oil doesn't really move on that, and you're wondering why. Well, you know, a lot of pressure on the paper markets, but also now today, just before we hit record, we learned that the uh, a deal is on the table to bring Iran back into the fold. You know, um, uh, let them sell their oil, even though that oil is already making its way to the market today. It's all a big joke, but you know, uh, roughly a million barrels a day counter. You know, and, um, and we're starting to leak out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve again. You know, there's a real chess match going on right now between MBS of Saudi Arabia and the Biden administration. And that's probably the most important relationship in the energy markets today. And um, right now, I would say that that relationship is strained um, for a variety of reasons. And so um, we shall see. I think the equilibrium price of oil, the price where producers invest enough to meet supply and uh, meet demand, with supply is going to be around that $80 brand, $85 brand, $80 WTI type frame. We're below that today. I don't think anybody actually in the oil market, Saudis or oil producers in the US included, want 100, 110, $120, $130 oil. It's not healthy. They all know what that means. That means recession is on the other side of it. Um, and so that that's probably sort of the equilibrium price. And as a general rule, um, that equilibrium price is much higher in a post-COVID world than it was before just because of the underinvestment in the sector and the lack of free money with interest rates at 5%. Um, and so whenever we see sort of extreme moves away from that, you, probably a safe bet that it will eventually regress to the mean in the in the short term. Okay. Yeah, we got a, a, a little gift, uh, maybe it was a month or two ago, where it shot down to $63 a barrel for a hot minute. And, yeah, uh, that was a tick to catch if you could, for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, we we got it at like sixty six. <laughs> it was close. Yeah. <laughs> Man, you had to be on it. It was like an hour. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. but, uh, but grateful we got it. Uh, okay, capitalist at large. Given the seventy five percent windfalls, windfall profits taxed in Euroland last year for gas producers. Why should any energy company bother to increase production when the U.S. and possibly China use their strategic petroleum reserve to manipulate prices and try to control inflation? What's the edge in owning energy under these circumstances? And then he says, heads or tails, we lose. Is there another side to this? Yeah, from the onset of this, our, you know, when, like, we don't give investment advice, right? Like, we are an educational newsletter, entertainment newsletter. We comment on markets, and sometimes people take the things they learned from us, insert it into their own investment process and fine, knock yourselves out. But when pressed, we would always try to look for derivative investments where, um, when I say derivative, I don't mean like stock options. I mean like one level away from the actual events. So let me give you an example. North America has a glut of natural gas. Uh, we wrote a piece called Guilt by Association, which talks about 
all the associated gas trapped in the Permian Basin and why this is driving, you know, natural gas in the U.S. to be $2 a million BTU, which, by the way, like on an oil equivalent basis is what, like $12 a barrel of oil, like for a really pristine, clean burning molecule. It's really amazing. So if you're a, you know, the idea we had last year and that we talked about with our pro-tier was if, if you're back integrated into natural gas in the U.S., but you can price your product on a global market, you're sitting pretty, right? Imagine a pure play, pick your favorite fertilizer producer, polyethylene producer. Um, I guess their polyethylene is not really back integrated into natural gas, natural gas liquids, but the point remains. Um, if you're back integrated into the cheap energy infrastructure of the U.S. or Canada, um, and you can then convert that energy into a solid product that is readily exported onto the market, you're basically exporting solid energy and capturing that arbitrage. And that arbitrage is just as powerful, not just as powerful, but it's pretty powerful at a $2, $8 spread between the US and Europe, four times the price, and also a you know, a $10, $80 spread, which is what we saw at the peak of the crisis, right? And so yeah. um, you know, we look for, especially in the private markets, because, you know, the, the, the public markets aren't giving valuations to anybody tied to any of these industries. Um, and so, you know, if, if you can get a private investment where shareholders are remunerated via dividends, where you have an opportunity to capture global arbitrage in the energy markets, that's a far simpler bet to make than a directional bet on the price of commodities. Um, yeah. There's a few instances where you might want to think about that. Like we highlighted a couple of subscribers last year when coal became more expensive than oil on a BTU content basis. That was a historic first and probably something you could have faded and, and related when thermal coal was more expensive than coking coal. Um, you could probably bet the jaws of that arbitrage would eventually close and they have. Uh, those were historic anomalies that we think were signaling both the nature of the energy crisis and a, a, a forward future of, of stagflation, which is largely laid out. Um, because if thermal coal is more valuable than um, premium coal that is used to make steel, the world needs more base energy, i.e. inflation, and it doesn't need much in the way of finished goods. And that was sort of our our loose interpretation of those market anomalies. Okay. Uh, Jerry Kane asks, what would be your collection of policies for a country to achieve 20% year over year sustained per capita GDP growth? That's a great question. Well, since energy is life, um, we would, um, you know, we, we wrote a policy called... Um, a, well, I forget what it was, it's 200 pieces later, but, um, you know, a sensible policy on U.S. energy, basically. And we had um, we had four pillars of that policy. One, um, a, a renaissance of nuclear power. All right, we're going to break this into two episodes. In part two, Doomberg does a deep dive into the nuclear power, energy, and uranium market. If you liked part one and you want to see part two, hit the subscribe with the little bell notification icon and you'll be notified when his next episode comes out. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time with Doombird.